I can watch what I'm saying. <clears throat> well, welcome, Rain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sunshine is wonderful, and the rain is very dear. And helps with practice, actually, for me. It brings all of the attention right here. Um, everything in our practice is a Dharma gate. And we're always pointing out Dharma gates in our life. Every moment is a Dharma gate. It's an opportunity to really be alive right here as it is. Tonight I wanted to uh, talk about one of the, uh, a very powerful Dharma gate. Uh, this is titled, Hold No Opinions, question mark. Really? Hold No Opinions? And there's a, a line that reoccurs often in Dharma, which is, hold no opinions for or against anything. And very often this is questioned. So I wanted to talk about opinions, kind of drill into opinion, not with the intention to criticize, we're to say we shouldn't, or we don't, or if we were only really good, you know, enlightened people, we wouldn't have opinions. But rather, uh, the way we approach any Dharma gate, which is to look into the nature of opinions. Um, and the, the, the starting point with this, as in any phenomenon, is to be aware when we're in or a state of opinion, what it feels like. So this is where we'll begin tonight. Um, we have them, we all have opinions. We all really like our opinions. We believe them or we wouldn't hold them. So that brings us to where we, where we look first, which is we hold opinions. So let's look at hold. And that's very often the way we approach any koan is to look at the specific words. And if there's a if there's a um, a key word in the in the line, hold no opinions for or against anything. It's the word hold, um, because if we if we are willing not to hold our opinions, to hold on to our opinions then uh, immediately they take their own kind of right place in what it's like in our process of discernment, right? Discern what's, what's uh, healthy, what's beautiful, what's friendly. So that's, that's on the continuum of opinion is discern. We discern and we need to. Um, to uh, actually to hold uphold the Dharma, to maintain and, and uh, live according to vow, we need to be discerning in what the actual conditions are and what the best response would be, the one that, that maintains well-being as best as we can. So uh, Tori Zenji, who was Hakuin Zenji's Dharma successor, Hakuin Zenji um, lived in the 18th century, said, if you want to realize the essence that is the same as all Buddhas, first you must clearly understand the root of ignorance. So that's our job as Buddhas to really understand what is meant by ignorance, one of the poisons, and probably the poison of the three poisons, greed, anger, and ignorance. But ignorance covers the whole field. Ignorance of interdependence, all form and the formless are, are marked by interdependence and impermanence. And um, opinions are no exception to that. Um, when we're looking into the nature of our opinion, we are, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're looking into the nature of our own karma, our own personal history, and our cultural history. So 
So in this tradition, ignorance is talks about um, believing appearances, forgetting to be aware, uh, not looking into, forgetting about the characteristic of impermanence and interdependence. And um, this includes all forms and the formless. So all forms, including the self, the sense of me, and the sense of me really is a, a, an immaterial, it's a, um, it's not a, um, It's immaterial. There's no material to this sensibility, this this experience of me, uh, and the entire material world is also subject to impermanence and interdependence. And the immaterial thoughts, emotions, beliefs, and very much opinions. So any form is subject to these three marks of existence. Right? Holding no opinion, but the, the uh, definition of holding includes maintaining a certain position, taking a position and planting ourselves there. That's often the way an opinion feels. And it also uh, implies being filled by whatever it is. And we are filled with our own opinions, or I am. Um, so to recognize it as as it uh, as it comes up, so what are what are some of the characteristics of opinions? Well, they're um, they're a belief or a conclusion that's held with confidence. If we look at our various voices when we when we state an opinion, we're in our confident self usually, and we're putting forth something that we're going to defend, maybe depending on who we're sharing it with. Um, sometimes we don't, we don't have to uh, defend our opinions and that, and we define the people with whom we don't have to defend our opinions, we define them as friends. Right? And those we have to defend, we're having an experience of enemy or other danger. Uh, they are, uh, opinions are definitely interpretations of very complex um, details. Uh, they often, always, maybe, carry an emotional charge. <clears throat> so we have a chance to look into and be aware of, oh, look at what comes up. Look at what comes up now. What is, what is this, uh, this particular feeling that I get when I'm in the opinion? And usually it excludes doubt. You know, it's a surety that, that is a closing down of doubt. Um, and it, uh, it commands our will. So we assert it. We assert it. And, and we haven't talked much about will, but will is definitely almost in me a sensation. I don't know about you, but when you're feeling willful, there's, even, there's a physical sensation to will. And that usually is found when we are asserting an opinion. So these are these are um, these are all characteristics of opinion. Ready to defend opinion. The other thing about opinion is often they don't change. And I'm thinking, depending on how kind of deeply embedded or how karmic opinions are rooted, they don't change. So for instance, one thing that's very true, I think, we can all probably agree to this, is if you're born into a Republican family, chances are you're going to be Republican or conservative. If you're born into a Democratic family, you're going to be Democratic, a Democrat or a progressive. You're not going to wander from that range of concerns. Um, so, so opinions don't change. Now, what about um, what about if you're born into a Catholic family and you 
you say, that's it. I don't want Catholicism. I'm not going to do it anymore. The solution to all of my problems is Buddhism. Well, good. <laughs> but um, very often, as, as people practice ever more thoroughly and deeply in this tradition, um, there's an awakening to how every one of the major traditions actually contains, in some aspect of it, uh, the, the true dharma. It is, this is, uh, this is the uh, arena of the perennial religion. And what that means is the perennial, it, it goes all the way back. There have always been awake human beings. Uh, it's not just Buddhism. They are found in uh, Roman times and Greek times, Babylonian times, uh, going all the way back. In Judaism, in uh, Islam, and, and um, there are so many different forms that the various religions are pro proclaimed in, right? So every religion has its very fundamentalist presentation, and it has its very uh, mystical presentation, its very direct presentation. Same is true in Buddhism, of course. Um, so, one of the things, uh, just to get come back to steer around to opinion, um, we if we really if we don't realize opinion and how it how it feels in us and how it behaves and how it functions to limit our view, we claim a stance and we hold to that stance, and, and it limits our view to anything that lies outside of the argument that might challenge it. I'm going to use a very, very ordinary, simple um, thing that I've come to know about myself and my opinions. I form very strong, I form opinions very quickly and very strongly, and they're usually really foolish. I mean, if I, if I remember, okay, hold on, this is an opinion, take a look. You know, so like I might be I mean, this happened to me. There's a great cloth store in Portland, and I go there. And as soon as I walk in, I spot the I spot the area of the cloth. It's usually the linen section, and I just go for the linen section. And then as I'm leaving, I realize, oh my goodness, I haven't looked anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you who've been in meetings with me know somebody will say something, make some really uh, some suggestion will go right away. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, you know, it's really, it's really cool to to uh, be willing to tune in to how uh, how you hold your own opinions and how they narrow uh, the the uh, the willingness to notice anything that lies outside of that territory to go beyond what you already know. And so this brings us in, in Buddhism, we talk about don't know mind. And it's very pertinent to this particular subject of opinion, because opinion is always in the mind that knows. You know, oh, I know, I know what went on that day. I know what their idea, what they had in mind or what their, you know, I'm just thinking uh, January 6th. Um, they were, we just, we don't know. We don't know. Um, so what is the what is the difference between the mind that knows and the mind that doesn't know? And I'm talking about experientially. How does it feel when you know? And how does it feel when you don't know? And I propose that it is a very different. Uh, don't know is less positional. Knowing it is a position. Not knowing there's a there's much more flexibility. It's open. And another word for openness is emptiness. So the more we, we appreciate don't know, the more we we partake of the wisdom of emptiness, which is this primary teaching in Buddhism. 
the vast field of form and formless is always operating in some way and coming forward into our minute intelligence, right? And um, we don't know. We don't know beyond our own narrow scope. So holding opinions. One of the things, too, related to this is words. Uh, Zen is a, is a practice that, that uh, rests on recognizing the characteristic of words and concepts and how they are not the thing itself, right? It's just it's that image of the finger pointing at the moon. If you keep looking at the finger, you don't see the moon for yourself. Right? So, um, uh, opinions usually are very, very directly embedded in words and concepts. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> so, when I, I, I thought we would do a little exercise together. I'm going to read a list, and I just encourage everybody to just notice the inner uh, reaction that you have physically, or you have a little comment that comes up in your mind, whatever it is, whatever form it takes. So here's the, here's the first one. What happens when I say abortion? How about libertarian? Ice cream. Hitler. Barbie. Dentist. Cancer. Watermelon. Border wall. Did you notice different uh, inner landscapes with each of those? That's a really uh, simple Zen um, example, you know, little practice to do, just to notice notice the response that happens internally to any word. So clearly, opinions matter and they frame even our body experience, how they function to limit or to expand awareness. Every opinion includes and excludes. So, um, tonight we're gonna chant, we're gonna do a different chant. It's called Affirming Faith in Mind. Some of you know it. Uh, it was put together by uh, uh, Sung San, who was the third Chinese ancestor after Bodhidharma, Huike Sung San. And uh, affirming faith in mind. So here's another word, faith. <laughs> so what does faith mean? Well, in general, uh, it, it's a serene commitment it's a willingness to look associated with the quality of energy. And it's faith in something. There is a faith in something. And it's a belief that doesn't rest on logical proof or material evidence. So, uh, mind. We all believe in mind and consciousness, yet there is no proof of it. There's no material proof of it yet. There are many going, going to look into that to try to figure out how to, how to prove that there is such a thing as consciousness. Does consciousness inhere in material? Or does material, is material uh, just one part of consciousness? You know, so, so that's a unanswerable as far as we know. 
The meaning of faith in the Buddhist tradition uh, refers to non-knowing in a fixed position and um, assuming uh, the mutability of everything and the conditionality of everything. And with faith, if we have faith, we can take risks. We can open into not knowing. We can tolerate uncertainty. Uh, it is it's sometimes defined as a deep inner movement based in a sense of trust. So, you know, you see a child flinging themselves at their parent. And they just assume that the parent's going to catch them. Hopefully that's the case. So it's based in a realization of one's innate nature. And it's based in freedom from conceptual attachments. One of the things that, that seems to be true is that when we start practice, we don't necessarily have faith in mind. We don't even know what that even, even refers to. And yet, as uh, with practice over time, Practice and study and precepts, there's a, there's a development of a sense of faith in one's own uh, life, that it is enough, that it, it is complete, and that things work. Um, so in this uh, affirming faith in mind, the, the first few lines are, the great way is not difficult for those who do not pick and choose. The great way being the Tao, the Tao which is beyond words, beyond concept. When preferences are cast aside, the way stands clear and undisguised. When we are not all wrapped up in our preferences, we just are free to see things just as they are, as is, just this. If you would clearly see the truth, discard opinions pro and con. If you pursue appearances, you overlook the primal source. So there is a there is a sense of uh, in uh, as we we practice of um, that of meaning in even the simplest things, and that meaning in here is in a kind of there being no separation from our own source. There's an integrity that happens increasingly in how we come across in the world. We really be, we, we know ourselves better and we do ourselves more. And we, there is a sense of, of, um, of the source is right here. We can, we can rely on our deepest self. Um, Hogan always says, do not judge, do not judge. So don't judge your meditation. Don't judge your skill and lack of skill. What judging is about opinion. Um, so in Dogen's um, universally recommended instruction for Zazen, which is in our chant book, but we rarely, we rarely chant it, although it probably would be a good idea to pick that up a little bit more. But these, there are these words, and this was written in the 13th century. Do not think good or bad. Do not judge true or false. Give up the operations of mind, intellect, and consciousness. Stop measuring the thoughts, ideas, and views. Have no designs on becoming a Buddha. How could that be limited to sitting or lying down? So he's saying even, even the, the notion of becoming a Buddha is, uh, is a distraction. It's not true. Because we all have the nature of Buddha. We all have the, the ability to wake up to what is. <coughs> simply and directly.
So I came across, after I put this together, I came across this, um, this line from Parmenides who lived in the fifth century BC, which is around the time of the Buddha. And he said, um, there are two ways. Here is the way of truth and the way of opinion. I thought, well, that's serendipitous. <laughs> At the time of the Buddha. And um, that's, there's, the, there's the evidence of the perennial, the perennial mind of, of wisdom. There's the way of truth. The truth is not a thing and it's not a statement. It is just what is. That's, that's where it's always pointing. So we want to be able to uh, relate to the essence of the Zen experience. That's why we're all here, you know, to really wake up to what is the quality of our own completeness. Are, are continuous, continual, completely coming forward in this moment, um, flowingly complete, emergent. So if we suffer because our ignorance, um, because of ignorance, then there must be some true insight. And the true insight has to do with seeing the nature of every element of mind, every form of the mind. And we find that each of us directly. So um, the liberating power of this truth doesn't lie in words or explanations, despite the fact that I'm going on and on about it. Um, but it must be deeply experienced. So it's why I'm pointing out and really uh, you know, dwelling on this whole business of hold no opinion, uh, hold no opinion, <laughs> come into a different relationship to opinion and be aware of it when it comes up and watch how it influences how things unfold. I wanted to share a little bit here. Uh, Dogen said, um, Cast away all speech, our words may express it, but cannot hold it. So words express, but do not, but are not the thing itself. Words come and go, and they're not what they're pointing to, which also comes and goes. And now I want to bring up one more concept in, in Zen which I don't think we've ever talked about, which is Nen, N-E-N, Nen. Nen is um, every mind moment is comprised of three Nen. That's a concept for you. And my understanding of that is not the, it's not important to say, well, what are the three, but just to say, any mind moment is more than just a moment. If we, if we stop to say, because we're always talking about this, this moment, where is the moment? What is a moment? A moment is not a thing. Where's the beginning of the moment? Where's the end of the moment? When you start really looking at that concept, we don't find a moment. That's just a progression of experience, right? So Nen uh, is a thought impulse. The, and what, one thing that's interesting is the Japanese character for Nen is composed of two radicals. One means now and one means heart. So what is now in the heart? It's so, it's so you know, it's like heart mind. We always talk about heart mind. Um, yeah, the impermanence of any phenomenon, all experience flows continually. And that's what's meant by emptiness. So opinions are as empty in their reality as any other thought.
and yet we hold them as real and substantial when we don't recognize the nature of them. So here's, here's a poem by Rio Khan. Above heaven, big winds. Above heaven, big winds. And then I wanted to share also a segment of a much longer poem by W.S. Merwin. Left foot, right foot. On the, in, on the same way, my own way of finding and losing. And in my own time, coming to one love, one place, day and night as they come to me. But the knowing and the rain, the dream and the morning, the wind, the pain, the love, the burning. It seems you must let them come so you can let them go. You must let them go. So you let them come. Merwin is a, uh, an old Zenny. Mm -hmm. But those last lines, it seems you must let them come so you can let them go. You must let them go. <coughs> so you let them come. Anything and everything. Uh, be a welcoming um, vessel, right? Each moment in its fullness comes and goes. We appreciate the particulars, the details, material and immaterial of our life. We may form our opinions as we also respect the fleetingness and insubstantiality of anything and everything that flows as our life. Any view in any way larger than my own eye can see. Bringing this view to our opinions opens our hearts and deepens our wisdom into the human condition. So thank you so much for listening and I hope that this becomes uh, useful in your own lives. <laughs>